Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Ashley Hopkins and this is Vet Candy. Today we're covering three important stories that are shaping our profession right now. Let's dive in. This program is brought to you by PRN Pharmacal, makers of Felicin CA1, Sirolimus Delayed Release Tablets. Felicin is the first disease-modifying drug that can give hope to owners of cats with subclinical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Inflation and veterinary salaries. First up, let's talk about money. Specifically, what's happening with veterinary salaries. Here's the headline. While our paychecks have gotten bigger over the past five years, our actual purchasing power has essentially gone backwards. According to Dr. Chris Doherty from the AVMA Veterinary Economics Division, when you adjust for inflation, veterinary salaries in 2024 are roughly at the same level they were back in 2004. The average real income for veterinarians in 2024 was 154,000. For the new grads entering full-time work, it was 129,000. That's in real dollars, meaning adjusted for inflation. So while the number on your paycheck might look higher than it did a few years ago, what that money can actually buy hasn't changed much in 20 years. The 2025 AVMA graduating senior survey found that nearly 60% of veterinary seniors secured full-time jobs before graduation, but 28% pursued advanced education and 7% received no offers at all. The percentage entering full-time employment has been declining every year since 2022. Here's the breakdown of where new grads are going. Companion animal practice is still dominant at 72.6% with an average starting salary of 140,000. Mixed practice accounts for 11% averaging 112,000. Equine is at 8% with 95,000 and food animal is just 3% at 100,000. Many new graduates are getting signing bonuses, 61% in fact, plus moving allowances and student loan repayment assistance. But the student loan picture is tough. The average debt for the class of 2025 was 212,000 among those with debt. About 40% owed over 200,000 and nearly 60% exceeded 400,000. The debt to income ratio sits at 1.4 to 1%. One bright spot, work hours are stabilizing. In 2025, veterinarians averaged 42.3 hours per week compared to 45.6 hours back in 2021. The bottom line, our profession is facing a real income stagnation problem combined with crushing student debt levels. Pet owner access to veterinary care. Now let's talk about how pet owners are viewing access to veterinary care. A new national study surveyed more than 1,100 adults and the results should be a wake-up call. When asked what access to veterinary care meant to them, 78% said it was about whether veterinarians were available when needed. 78% said it was about how easy it was to communicate with a clinic. And about 75% said affordability was the primary concern. Convenience and communication mattered just as much as price. Here's where it gets concerning. Among pet owners who had recently sought care, more than half, 55%, said that they did not fully trust their veterinarian. And over one third said they weren't happy with how their vet interacted with them, even if they were satisfied with the actual medical care. So what are they doing instead? 67% of pet owners said vet techs could provide care equal in quality to a veterinarian. Pet owners, especially younger owners, those without advanced degrees and those earning under $100,000, said they'd be willing to use these alternative providers if it meant their pets could be seen sooner or at a lower cost. The message is clear. Improving access isn't just about lowering prices. It's about rebuilding trust, enhancing communication, and meeting with pet owners where they are. Finally, let's talk about artificial intelligence in veterinary medicine. A recent study compared AI adoption between Chinese and North American veterinary professionals and the differences are fascinating. Researchers surveyed 
455 veterinary professionals in China and compared them with nearly 4,000 professionals in the U.S. and Canada. Despite reporting lower familiarity with AI, only 55% in China versus 84% in North America, Chinese veterinary professionals had 71% adoption rate. That's nearly double North America's 39% adoption rate. Chinese vets are using AI primarily for clinical applications, disease diagnosis, and treatment at 50%, prescription calculations at 45%, and treatment planning at 36%. They're using tools like DeepSeek, ChatGPT, Gemini, and veterinary-specific platforms like Minivet. North American professionals are using AI differently. Imaging and radiology analysis at 39%, record keeping and administrative tasks at 39%, voice to text transcription at 37%, and diagnosis and disease detection at 34%. We're focusing more on workflow efficiency and reducing administrative burden. Both groups agree the number one barrier is concerns about AI reliability and accuracy. 70% in North America and 54% in China, but North American professionals are significantly more worried about data security and privacy at 54%, implementation costs at 43%, and job displacement at 36%. The takeaway? There's no one-size-fits-all approach to AI adoption, and we might be overthinking this in North America, but Chinese experience suggests that the hands-on experimentation can be valuable. Hi, I'm Dr. Haley McDonald, a veterinary cardiologist based in California. Some of you may know me as the Rhythm Vet. Today we're talking about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in cats. Did you know that feline cardiomyopathy affects approximately one in seven cats with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or HCM being the most common form? HCM is a sarcomeric disease characterized by increased diffuse or regional ventricular wall thickness. The hypertrophy occurs in the absence of loading conditions, infiltrative disease, or metabolic stimuli. On clinical examination, some cats with HCM may exhibit a murmur, arrhythmia, or gallop rhythm, while others may have normal cardiac auscultation findings. Echocardiography is the most sensitive non-invasive method for diagnosing HCM and excluding other causes of myocardial hypertrophy. Classically, HCM is defined by end diastolic echocardiographic measurements of ventricular wall thickness equal to or greater than six millimeters once other causes of left ventricular hypertrophy have been ruled out. Prognosis for cats with HCM is variable. Some remain self-clinical and live normal lifespans, but approximately 30% develop severe complications, including left side of congestive heart failure, arterial thromboembolism, ATE, or sudden death. Despite extensive research, no current medical therapy has been proven to delay disease progression, improve quality of life, or provide a survival benefit in the subclinical stage of feline HCM. Recently, attention has been turned to delayed-released rapamycin, which modulates the mTOR pathway for its potential to prevent or reverse cardiac hypertrophy in rodent disease models. The RAPACAT trial, a double-blinded, multi-center, randomized, placebo-controlled pilot study, evaluated both low- and high-dose delayed-release rapamycin administered once weekly in client-owned cats with preclinical HCM. After six months, the maximum left ventricular wall thickness was significantly lower in the low-dose group compared with the placebo, and the treatment was well-tolerated. These findings suggest that rapamycin may exert antihypertrophic effects. A molecular study supported these results and also demonstrated beneficial effects on autophagy and potential antithrombotic properties. Clinically, these results indicate that delayed release rapamycin may help prevent or delay progressive left ventricular hypertrophy in cats with subclinical HCM. Further, larger scale studies are warranted to confirm and expand upon these findings. This has led to the initiation of the HALT HCM trial, a multi-center, blinded, randomized, placebo-controlled clinical field study conducted in cats with subclinical HCM over 12 months. This study is currently underway. 
In early 2025, the FDA granted conditional licensing for Sirolimus, the first drug with antihypertrophic properties for cats, under the formulation known as Felicin CA1. If proven effective in treating adverse cardiac remodeling, this therapy could offer veterinarians and cat owners a much needed option for managing ventricular hypertrophy in cats with subclinical HCM, marking a promising step forward in addressing this challenging disease. And now for some of the safety information for Felicin CA1. The most frequently observed adverse reactions in cats treated with Felicin CA1 were cardiovascular in nature, relating to the progression of HCM. Other adverse reactions observed were lethargy, vomiting, diarrhea, and inappetence. Treatment with Felicin CA1 has been associated with the elevation of the transaminase enzymes which include alanine aminotransferase, ALT, and aspartate aminotransferase, AST. Do not use Felicin CA1 in cats with diabetes mellitus. Pregnant and breastfeeding women should avoid contact with Felicin CA1. For complete safety and dosing information, please consult the package insert. Thanks for watching. For more cardio vet tips, follow me at The Rhythm Vet. So there you have it. Three stories that paint a complex picture of where our profession is right now. We're dealing with real income stagnation and crushing student debt. We're facing a crisis of trust and access with pet owners. And we're navigating a technological revolution that's unfolding very differently around the world. So that's it for today's show. Thank you so much for watching. Want to keep up with everything VetMed? Follow us at MyVetCandy.